Yes, ready, Sharon. Okay, we'll open the meeting then. Thank you. Okay, welcome everybody to our May uh, public board meeting. We are holding the meeting in public and it will be streamed by YouTube, so it will be accessible to the public. So welcome to any members of the public or governors who are joining us this morning. So if we start please with item one, apologies for absence. I don't think we have any, Jenny, do we? Um, item two, declarations of interest. You all have the paper in front of you. If there are any new declarations, can you please let Jenny know? And if you've got any items on the agenda where you need to declare an interest, please do so and excuse yourself from that item. Item three is minutes of the meeting held on the 29th of April. Are there any points of accuracy that you've not already let Jenny know? No, are there any matters arising that are not on the actions list? No? Okay, if we could go to item four, which is the actions log, um, page one. Anything on that page? Uh, just one, I think, from me. Um, we've obviously postponed the June um, board timeout um, because of the situation with COVID, but as you know, this is being rearranged. So we'll just update that. Jenny, on the list, please. Uh, page two, anything on that? No, thank you. If we could then move, we should be having a patient story. I'll just check. Has and Oh, Andy, I think, has arrived. Morning, Andy. Hiya, sorry about that. No worries. Morning, Andy. Oh, don't worry. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. So um, this morning we're going to have our patient story um, with us as well. So I thank Lucy, Sam, Andy and Mandy for joining us this morning. Uh, Mandy, would you like to introduce um, everybody and the story this, this month, please? Ah, yes. Um, we've got Andy, who is a patient at the Market Wheaton GP Surgery, Sam, who is an advanced nurse practitioner, and Lucy, who is a physiotherapist. All have been using video consultations with patients, some more than others. But what we'd like to do today is share with you Andy's experience of being a patient on the other side of the video consultation and the clinician's experiences. Um, Sam is also and Lucy are also going to feed back the GP's perspective of the um, video consultations as well. So what works, what's not working so well and how they view it moving forwards. So can I start with Andy? Would you like to just introduce yourself and also your experiences of using the video consultation? Can you take yourself off mute, Andy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I was just giving you a second. Um, I had uh, an issue with my eye, which I thought was a sty, and got an appointment and it turned out to probably be a, a skin infection, which was good. And, and being able to look at it over the video um, meant that I didn't have to go in. I have severe Crohn's disease, so I am shielding. Um, so that was handy. It was very, very quick. Like they said, they'd ring up in about an hour and about five minutes later, somebody was back to me. Um, um, and that was good. It, it stopped me having to go anywhere. Um, the app itself, the link itself was interesting. It took a little bit to work it out. And I think that at one point there was a, a text box that I had to click that allowed my phone, the app access to my phone camera and mic, which we're all probably familiar with. But if I remember rightly, it was almost the same color as the background. So actually working out you had to press somewhere was difficult. So I'd get somebody to go through it a few times and as if they really struggled to see something. Um, but other than that, yeah, the, it was really good to have a, a really quick response because my GP, like a lot of GPs around here, they're overstretched even before COVID and getting an appointment can take a while. There's no reflection on them. It's, it's just how the world is at the minute. Um, and being able to see somebody quickly 
and efficiently was good. It would be great for, I, I'm lucky, I'm registered disabled, so I don't have to go to work and things like that. But for somebody that had to work, you know, your appointment takes five minutes. You could do it conceivably at work if you can find somewhere private um, without having to take a whole day off waiting for a call back. So that was good. Um, and generally, yeah, it was all right. I mean, my I live with my 70-plus-year-old mother who would possibly have had a little bit more difficulty um, getting it to open and work. Um, but she would probably have worked it out. She can just about work FaceTime now, so that's okay. Uh, she's all right. She's laughing at me. Um, so, yeah, a handy tool um, to have to, to get looked at quickly. Um, I think we, we had a chat the other day, and the, there was one concern that I had for the future, but I can bring that up later if you'd, you'd rather, but it was to do with over-reliance on it. So I'll, I'll leave it there. If you want to ask about that, I'll tell you in a bit. Okay, Mandy, who should we hear from next? Okay, Sam, would you like to go next? Yeah, okay. So, um, like Andy said, he was booked in for a telephone consultation. Um, video wasn't even on the radar at that point. Um, basically, he took a history and there was just something not quite right, not with what Andy was telling me, but with about the diagnosis. And um, so I mentioned to Andy about going onto the video um, and he agreed and we linked up and it was good because we were able to see that it wasn't what we first thought, but it was actually something else like Andy said, an infection. So I was able to treat accordingly. Um, what I found is that in general, people do find it easy to set up. Um, obviously, tech savvy patients find it very useful. Um, but also the video provides an environment like face to face to pick up on cues um, and any concerns the patient has. Um, I found that patients are very willing to try a different approach as well. It's another route of accessing healthcare. Um, it's not for everybody, but if, it, if it's appropriate for the patient and for the clinician, then I think it's very good. What I found is MSK, which Lucy will be able to speak about, you can see and show different movements and things like that. Also skin, very good for rashes, as in Andy's case as well. Um, what the doctor has reported is that, um, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous here. Um, she has used it in the elderly in the presence of the carer, their carer to get an end of bedside impression um, of general state of well-being. What the doctor found is that during this lockdown, patients have been reluctant to come into the surgery or family members have called us for concern. So in regards to home visits, um, she's found it very good for triaging um, and advising paramedics um, a management plan and has proven effective and valuable. Um, a general look can often tell a lot and over a phone call, the video call has avoided unnecessary admissions, visits, um, or backed up the need to encourage an admission. So from skin to MSK to doing ward rounds at nursing homes, video consultations can at times lend itself to look at many different presentations. But going back to Andy, I certainly feel it was a pretty straightforward consultation through the video. And I also think for me and patients, it lends itself to also stop the video consultation and review for maybe a face-to-face. -face. So it isn't, we're not just relying on video consultations, if that makes sense. It does. Thank you, Sam. That's really, really informative. Thank you. Lucy, would you like to give us your perspective? Yeah, of course, yes. 
So, um, as you know, I'm a physio, the first contact physiotherapist, but I'm also a trainee advanced clinical practitioner, so I'm seeing uh, various conditions, skin and such like as well, at the moment, under supervision. Uh, but my experience of, of it has been uh, that patients genuinely absolutely love it. Um, I've had, I've done quite a lot of consultations with it now and used it as part of the um, assessment tool. And patients have been very happy to try it. Some are elderly, actually, when I don't think they would they would want to, to try it, but they have. Um, it's been, um, when it was the, the, I was using my phone, it was more tricky, but now we've got set up on the PVC for the video, the, the images are bigger. So you can see a lot more. Um, and I think the patients, it, it is some are, if it's the first time that they've used anything, it is a bit nerve-wracking. So I use the phone first and sort of try and talk them through what they're doing. So you can talk to them on the phone, on the landline, if they've got one, and while they're using their phone as well. So you can have a sort of three-way communication going on as well. Um, the patient that was particularly helpful for MSK was a young man that's on a tractor who told me that his knee was a little bit swollen um, and I could see her who wanted to show me an image and this knee was actually hugely swollen and very red so it helped confirm my diagnosis and, and what I was going to do with him because I think patients say something's a little bit swollen when actually it's very swollen or vice versa um, and the, the rashes in particular it's been helpful for and um, also just assessing range of movement of patients um, so, yeah, elbows, wrists, ankles, all sorts of things, and demonstrating what exercises they perhaps should be doing. They can actually see me, I'm demonstrating the exercise, and they can see what it is. Because sometimes the exercises that you're, you're talking through is very difficult. So generally, I found it extremely helpful, and I know my other first contact physio colleagues are using it an awful lot. And I think it's something that we, I would certainly like to keep using in the future. I mean, it's not ideal for some patients, I appreciate that, but I think having it as an option sounds as a tool to help sort of confirm a diagnosis and a management plan for patients um, is a really good thing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, has anybody got any questions or comments from the board for, um, for Lucy, Sam, Andy on Monday? Chair, can I just ask Andy, you were going to mention something about, about maybe the long-term use. Um, did you want to do you want to raise that now? Are you happy to do that? Yeah, I can do that. Um, I found it quite easy, and in a, in a sort of post-COVID world that we're all running towards, there's going to be pressure to claw back the expenditure that's coming. And as much as this was great, and it's getting lots of positives I can see at some point um, down the line somebody's going to say well we can see X patients for X cost at X speed and it makes more sense to close my smaller surgeries and have bigger let's say super surgeries with video conferencing and I want particularly the board to think long and hard should that ever come to pass because as great as it was it's already difficult for people to get into my GP because the, the population of my little market towns almost doubled um, and if we go to this it's not going to work for everything so as great as it, it seems it should be an extra or um yeah, no, just an extra to what the physical GP surgery is. Um, and that, that is the only thing that popped into my head that worried, that as much as I found it useful, I found it quick, I could do it while at work, um, and I said my mother could use it, she would hate to have to use it because she can't get to like her GP, if that makes sense. Yes, Sam did. Sharon, it's Dean. Could I ask a question? Of course, you can, Dean. Hi. Uh, well, th thank you to uh, to Lucy and uh, and Samantha, and of course to uh, Andy for uh, sharing that story and uh, those insights with us, and uh, particularly the, uh, the sort of last comments, uh, uh, which I guess uh, Andy are about 
uh, you know, an additional uh, versus supplementary uh, type of, uh, of support. Uh, I mean, th th these um, sort of video consultations have, have been in development for some years and, and they've accelerated significantly during uh, COVID. And I just wondered, uh, maybe from some of the um, professional colleagues on the call, but uh, about whether there's any sort of um, sort of research going on in terms of outcomes. So these might be things that people want to use, um, but I guess we'll, you know, there's a great opportunity to collect data on successful outcomes uh, for people and you know uh, the pros and cons of doing it in a timely way versus what you might be missing out. I just wondered if anyone knew if, if any of that was going on either at Humber or, or, or broadly. Um, perhaps Lynn or John, um, either of you, could you help yeah. with the answer? So um, there, there is a large commercial supplier out there, um, Dean, which I think has over 100,000 patients in, in some parts of the country. They have been regulated by the CQC and actually have re received a, a rating of outstanding from memory around some of their services. So looking at the outcomes would have been part of that CQC work that they did. So this, this has been looked at from an NHS perspective for the last four or five years. Um, I, I think the point is it's not a panacea for everything, is it? And it's not a panacea for all patients. Um, it might increase health inequalities for some, but decrease them from others. And I think we've heard some of that from the story. Um, but there is a fairly large body of work out there which, mean, which says this is absolutely safe to do if you get it right. Um, but the getting it right piece is still evolving and there's still guidelines emerging, whether it's from the Royal College of GPs, Royal College of Psychiatrists, nursing, the whole lot suddenly cottoned on that there's, I don't want to hog this, Sharon, but there's a, there's a key issue here is about how do we retrain ourselves to become digitally enabled to consult with patients? Because it's a completely different skill to face to face, let alone to down the telephone line. Um, and, and, and that's the training piece we probably need to think about going forward from a strategic point of view in the organisation. But we won't be alone in that. Thanks very much, John. Thank you. Thanks for that, John. Uh, Sharon, I can just say from a mental health point of view, being on the national work, there are pockets now of larger studies um, are taking place around the country, maybe from our IAPS, because obviously we did a lot around IAP services particularly. Um, in fact, the actual some of the data that's just coming through actually today is actually saying they've done more consultations through IAP during COVID than we did before. And they think that's something to do, obviously, with the digital platform. So, that, yes, to answer the question, yes, there is specific research going on around the mental health aspects of the face-to-face -face consultation that's due out sort of within the next couple of months, or the initial feedback will be in the next couple of months. So we'll keep an eye on that. Thank you, Michelle. Karen, just to add to that as well, I mean, some of these changes, I mean, not the use of digital in primary care, because John says, Actually, that has been in place for quite some time, so there is a body of evidence around that. But I think what's really important for us, there are some changes that we have made in the way that we deliver some of our services through our COVID experience. Um, but I think what's really important as we plan now is that we do take that absolute opportunity, I think it is connected to Andy's point, to make sure that our service users engage with that and our principles of co-production you know continue despite the pace in which we've had to make some of those changes and i think patient experience and patient involvement you know are really critical and it's great that we've got with mandy's work that platform um, to work from but in, in order to you know connect that well to to the service changes the plans that we've now um, started to consolidate um, in the next phase of, of covid is really important can, can we just talk about Andy's question about what it means for his own particular surgery? Now, and Andy, in Mark of Wheaton, you, you've got literally a state-of-the-art surgery, which is fantastic. Um, and in many ways, the, the digital move will allow Mark of Wheaton to actually have increased capacity going forward, which I think will ultimately protect it. Because if we currently we think about GP surgeries as being eight to six o'clock Monday to Friday, but the reality is with a digital platform, we could actually start thinking about real seven day a week services. And then when you've got a bespoke building like Market Wheaton, actually you can use that capacity more and more going forward. So I think there's real benefits uh, for some surgeries which are currently struggling with 
the size of their building or the state of the buildings. And actually, the digital approach might relieve some of that pressure and actually enhance their um, processes going forward. So I, I, I can reassure you with regard to Market Wheaton that, that you know, I think you're sitting pretty because of the state of the building and the, and the technology you've got out there. Um, actually, go ahead, Andy. Market Wheaton does have a fantastically built new surgery. Okay. We're going to take that away from it. But when it was built and designed, as I understand, being a resident when they were touting it, it's got all kinds of facilities it was designed to have inside it that funding just never appeared for. So actually about half of the buildings got empty rooms that uh, aren't being used. As I understand, and I, and I could be wrong, but it's just from a resident's perspective, it was supposed to have a a minor surgery place, a chiropodist, and various other things in there, um, physiotherapist, and and a lot, of, I believe, as you go in the door, to the right, all down there is, like, not in use. So, yes, we can have a new building and we can do this. And it's great to, to say, like you said, it's a fantastic building. The car park doesn't get used for some reason. But um, when you talk about that, it has, from a resident's point of view, seemed to fall short of what it was supposed to have in it when it happened. Now, we believe, from people that live on my street and people that I talk to in here, and we're more than possible to be wrong, and it's all great fine information, that that's due to the fact that these things were supposed to happen and then there wasn't funding for it. So even though the room was built, the, the, there was never put in. Um, and that makes some of what you say seem a bit contradictory. Yeah, the building's great, it's fantastic. But if we're not even using half of it for what we're supposed to be in there, you know, I, I, sorry, I've gone off track. I don't. I don't know if I'm. No, I, no, 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 no. I think you. I think you're right. So you know, it is a fabulous building, um, and it's like anything. I'll say the one advantage is I think it's future proof to have all the services in it. There is something though. How do we tackle the health inequalities, not just for Market Wheaton but other places, and have some of those services which are traditionally delivered in bigger places. Um, closer to um, the communities. And obviously, we do provide some of the services, such as general practice and mental health, but other services, we rely on other providers to provide those services um, in those buildings as well. So some of it's within our control um, and some of it is without of our control. But the one advantage is we have that resource there, which I would agree we need to make more use of. Can I, can I make a suggestion? I know that you've got a very active uh, patient group at Market Wheaton because um, they've been to the board before. Um, and um, maybe it's a discussion that could be, you know, sort of explored with the patient um, group um, in the actual surgery. Because, as I say, I know you've got a very involved and active patient group in Market Wheaton, which is fantastic. But I think it's a good point, Andy, and I thank you for raising it. And I thank you for your other um, constructive points as well. Uh, just before we finish, has anybody got anything else that they want to ask or comment on? Um, I'd like to just comment on regarding the tele um, video consultations. Um, from a clinician's point of view, um, I, meant, I think it was John that uh, mentioned about um, training and ways of looking at um, how to increase your skills. Um, what I found is that because it is video and also telephone consultations, we are having to, um, we are wanting to be more fuller in our um, history taking because we can't see the patient face to face via telephone. But also when it comes to video as well, we are much more aware that we're not in our usual environment for mm. ourselves and the patient. So sometimes we're finding that it can take just as long doing a telephone yeah. and a video compared to face to face. So I'm trying to kind of reassure Andy that we are being even more thorough um, in our history taking, in our management plan and shared decision making um, because we're not actually face to face with that patient. Yeah, Dave. Yeah. Chair, Chair, just a, a question. Um, this is Francis. 
is, is it a useful tool asking Samantha and, and Lucy to potentially screen? I know there's certain patients that are reluctant sometimes to come in and cause problems at the GP because they know that they're busy, whereas this is obviously an opportunity to do that from home, screen, and then, then if there is a need to come in, they can then come in. So it gives you a chance to kind of stream what's going on. Absolutely. I mean, I think um, we do. it's not about being tunnel visioned about these video consultations, but they must be just used for everybody, for every symptom and everything like that. What I've found from clinicians is that we like to actually um, phone the patient first to get have that conversation, to get the history, um, and then, if it's appropriate, use the video consultations. Because, of course, some people, it isn't for everybody. What the doctor reported was um, that some people struggle to actually get into surgery due to work, um, those working away, um, those wary, especially now, of um, wary of infection risk, or even children who get anxious coming into the surgery. Video consultations can work. But again, going back to your point, Francis, Yes, you know, if the patient is wanting a face-to-face -face, but there is an appointment um, and they don't want to um, a telephone appointment, we could offer video. So at least you're getting that face-to-face -face contact, they feel as if they're being listened to, and then take it from there and decide between us, okay, do we need to bring you in or can we sort this, you know, face-to-face -face via the video? Um, it's about working together. Thanks for that, that's really helpful. Thanks, Sam. That's really good. So, is there anything, what, any final question or comment before we um, move on? Can I just make a comment, Sam? Can I just say, sort of sincerely to, to everybody, really, just a big, a big sort of thank you, because I think as John alluded to, we've been looking at and discussing video, you know, utilisation of videos, different platforms, firm consultations for a while, in part to help access that, that I think Samantha's just touched on, but also as a way forward. So, and I think the, 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 impl you know, the implementation of how quickly you have done that due to, due to the unprecedented situation has been remarkable. So, so thank you. I mean, you said at the beginning you didn't have all the, the tools necessarily to start off with, but you've, you know, you've got those. So just if there's anything else that we can do to support you, I think we, we, that would be really helpful, but just absolutely fantastic. Well done. Because I think the feedback we're getting from, from patients like Andy and others is that it really is beneficial and they, they, they absolutely really welcome it. So I think going forward, we do have to look at what are the really good bits that we keep and then picking up on some Andy's points what are the other things that we maybe just move forward in a slightly different way but certainly so well done to do it so quickly and with such good outcomes and such positivity so so thank you and if there is anything else that you need training support or anything just let us know Thank you. Thank you. Connection issue. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. I mean, these jokes is is can be terrible, and and we talked about that because we're all on the 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 trust Wi-Fi at the moment, so we're just a bit worried about our capacity as well. So, <laughs> and so I think I think we are we are trying to work through that. I mean, Pete, we are trying to work through some of the the broadband IT issues. Not putting you on the spot, are we? But um, we are sort of having. A <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> but we are. Yeah. <laughs> I think you might be putting me on the spot a little bit about connectivity in a row and area. Michelle, but you know we are deploying the network to improve our connectivity speed wherever we can. And, and, and some of the areas that we tried in are better than others, but we are sort of speaking to the providers and, and constantly. I mean, I know that Lee's on the call. I mean, they do some fantastic, IT have been fantastic through all this, but and I know they're constantly looking and reviewing who's got the best coverage and, and what have you. So, um, yeah, it, it is it is difficult. I mean, HQ itself is difficult. <laughs> Uh, can I just one final appeal, Sharon? Yes, it's just that um, it, I think it's great that we've been able to do this, and we've shown how complex it is to have everyone in the room, but you can do it. Um, if, if I could just appeal to fellow board members and people watching in to download the NHS app onto your phone, log in and try and use it, because actually, if you think about digital consultations and you think about the NHS app, they're all linked in together in terms of improving the quality of the data, which is our data that we own. So um, I'd be interested, to, as we develop these conversations going forward at board level, if people would just download the app, because then they just might be able to see some potential opportunities around this work going forward. Thank you, John. 
Um, can I thank you, um, Andy, um, Sam and Lucy and Mandy as well. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Andy, uh, it's great to hear um, your experience direct from you. And I think you made some really good um, points and hopefully uh, um, we'll take some of those um, forward. But um, can I echo what Michelle said? Thank you to you all, uh, particularly um, Sam and Lucy and all your colleagues for all that you're doing at the moment. It really is appreciated. Um, and Andy and all of you, thank you very much for spending the time with us this morning. It really does make a difference to us to hear it from you direct uh, rather than just a piece of paper. Uh, it brings it alive and enables us to have these uh, discussions and hopefully make improvements uh, for the future. So thank you all very, very much for joining us. Thank you. Great, great stuff. Great stuff. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Okay, well, that was fantastic. Hello, yeah. yes. It's Francis. Sorry, I, I should have said, could, could we just go back one item onto the action log, if you wouldn't mind? Yes, Francis, we can. The, the very last action, which, uh, if Dean doesn't mind me saying it, uh, about the risk register was about the workforce risks and mitigation to be discussed at the next Workforce and OD Committee. That was done at the last OD Workforce and OD Committee. So, so that, that action was done. It's Thank you. The date to be confirmed. We did do it last week, didn't we, Dean? Uh, we did, yes. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Francis. Yeah. OK, that's great, Francis. So we can update. Um, well, we, in fact, we can take that one off as well, Jenny. So there's a couple um, on the um, first page to be updated, as we discussed. And I think we can mark that then as completed. Thank you, Francis, for that. OK, so if we could move on then to item six, which is my chair's report. Um, I'd like to start with uh, just freedom to speak up. Um, Peter, Barron, um, myself and Michelle met virtually with Alison Flack, our freedom to speak up guardian for our usual regular meetings to discuss work and what's going on in the cases. Um, as you all know, we're presently advertising for two deputy uh, guardians, hopefully to cover the whole of the patch. And I understand that there's been a really good um, response to those adverts, so that's really encouraging and great to see. Uh, Peter Barron and a staff governor and Michelle um, Moran will be um, interviewing for that post. So um, that, watch this space with the deputy position, but oh, that's very good. Um, in terms of the governors, um, I've had virtual meetings with the public governors and staff governors in the last week, and they've gone really well. well. Um, so we're going to reintroduce the governor groups, hopefully soon. Um, in terms of Humber Coast and Vale and the ICS, I continue to be involved in a number of uh, regular chairs and other meetings. And I know Michelle picks up quite a bit of this in her report. But I've been invited to take part in a development workshop about the um, system operating arrangements and governance on the 3rd of June. Um, so I'll report back after that. And just finally from me, um, I think Lynn picks up on this in the publications report, but I'd like to thank the volunteers, um, including volunteer services who oversee this and the governors who are volunteering. Um, I understand that we've got more volunteers than ever. People have been volunteering and have been actively engaged in helping our patients and their families throughout this period. So I think they've done a fantastic job and I just wanted to recognise that contribution during this period. So any questions for me before we move on? No, thank you very much. Um, so if we move to item seven, which is the Chief Executive Report, Michelle. Thanks, Chair. Just picking up on the theme to speak up, what we have also done is just amplified the communications about the freedom to speak up role, not just the you know, not just the, the, the vacancy issue, but the fact that it's there for staff, especially at this difficult time through COVID, if they feel that they need to use that as a particular route to air any issues or complaints. So we have done a, a big com a, a communications push on that and we'll continue to do that. Um, obviously, everything's in my report. I will take it that people have read it. As usual, I'll pick out just a couple of things and then we can have a, some questions and answers. Um, I do, um, obviously, as people know, I do like to be really visible around the organisation. So um, what we've been doing is, I mean, obviously, I have been going into the office, but we've been doing Skype calls or team calls around the organisation with the majority of teams, including corporate, I'm working my way around everybody, and they're going really well. And the feedback that we're getting is that people are actually you know, really maximising the benefits of the Skype uh, IT platform or, or Teams to actually make contact with their teams themselves. And whereas before it was taking quite a lot of time to have conversations and team meetings that can all get together very regularly. And I think they're really all finding some real benefits for that. And that was one of the real clear 
things that came. That and the morale of staff being, being very high. So they've been really, really useful uh, conversations. And I'll continue to do those, actually, even once we start to get into phases three and four of, of, of COVID as normal, um, just because I think it's a really good way of touching base with, with all staff across the organisation. And we're certainly moving forward a bit more on that. Um, it's really good that the organisation is part of some of the COVID research, and I thank John and his team for that, and Catherine Hart particularly. Um, we're doing a principal study, um, and I think that's really, really important. Um, and certainly we'll be looking to see what other COVID research we can do in the organisation going forward, because obviously it's a national push, but it does feed into some of the, the, the local work. I mentioned the ECT accreditation, which is fantastic. And then I'll just pick out a little bit about the integrated care system. We have now been successful um, in becoming an integrated care system, which is great news and just show confidence in the partnership. Um, obviously, the, the ICS has been spending a lot of time on COVID planning, working in partnership for testing, PPE particularly, amongst other things. So now we're going into the next phase, and we'll pick up a bit of this in the COVID paper, which is phase two, which is that restore and recover. Now, as we've already alluded to, we've kept going with most of our services anyway, um, which is great, but this is about how do we support the system and care homes particularly. So you'll see there the bullet points that I've listed um, from a, an integrated care system. And one of the things that we are doing is to really link the social care with the healthcare system through the ICS and also to really start to look at inequalities because I think John alluded to this uh, in the, the last item about inequalities and specifically inequalities related to COVID. So we are going to be concentrating a lot of the, the modelling, the public health work and the public health directors into starting to address some of those inequalities. And we had the first health and wellbeing board um, semi-meeting yesterday, there was a few uh, IT problems, but we started to have those conversations in Hull. So that's there as well. I will draw the board's attention to something specific that I probably just need um, some, some uh, probably approval, I think, for want of a better word, and that's the governance review. If you remember, as the Foundation Trust, we need to have an external governance review done. Um, and I think it's a, it's a review of up to five years. We're not due till May 2022, but we did say we'd have a look at it in 20. I just I think given the COVID situation where we're at, um, the fact that we've had two CQC um, full comprehensive assessments and come up with good on um, the well-led, I think that we should postpone that and review it towards the, the end of this year, moving into 2021. Um, and then the rest of the director update. So I'll leave it there, Chair. It's there for information. People have read it. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Mike, okay. Mike, oh, Cook here, Mike Cook here, if I may. Go on, um, Mike. Thanks for a comprehensive report again, uh, Michelle, and you and the team's leadership over this, I think, really difficult, unprecedented period. And uh, I think your proactivity has been really good. So um, I was going to mention 1.5 external governance review. I support your proposal because I think we are now much more self-regulating over the last couple of years. I think I'd cite the outturn, I'd cite the quality of the effectiveness reviews we're going to discuss today of our subcommittees and indeed the board and also um, the quality account. So I think there's quite a bit of um, evidence to back that up. If I may, uh, could I just commend three or four things? I think the ECTAS, uh, the ECT accreditation scheme, is really important for Miranda House. It's a, a difficult procedure. It needs to be done right, and it's great that we've got that uh, uh, gold standard now. Um, the Back to Basics campaign is, is, is incredible. It's very, very simply designed and very clear. Well done. Um, welcome the changes to the integrated um, uh, performance report. It's a continuous improvement thing, but that will improve it, so thank you. Um, and I thought the comms around the International Nurses Day and the uh, message wall, um, particularly now an appreciation uh, wall, uh, was really best practice. I think good, we should also, well done the volunteers, but also health stars have been very active with community and 
and staff support under four. So uh, some good stuff there. I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And I will completely endorse the issues from communication. I mean, I was going to mention that at the end, actually, Chair. It just, I mean, all all staff have worked amazingly well, but communications particularly. Um, we, you know, we, we said thank you to a lot of people, and I think sometimes we don't always um, you know, congratulate things like internal comms as much as we need to do, and they have been amazing getting things out and quickly. I mean, everybody has been IT. I've mentioned that. I've mentioned estates. I've mentioned the clinical staff, but specifically, and obviously our volunteers. We mentioned last time, but um, but yes, thanks, Mark, for that. Chair, Chair, could I say a few things? Yes. Um, again, I, I endorse a lot of what Mike said. Um, I, I think it's uh, there's some really, really good examples of the virtual working that Michelle's talked about, and we heard in the, on the the patient story, and and we need to link that. There's a discussion in here about the offices going forward. And, and I think we need to link all of that up strategically in terms of the way we do things and the way that we make use of offices and how that is developed. And I know I've had the odd chat with John, for example, about how some of the clinicians are working differently. All, all of that, I know you're all on it. How we bring all of that together is great. And you can see even the chaplain is doing virtual mm -hmm. services. Yeah. So, so it's just how we take that forward as an overview. Like Mike, I think the um, ECT work is excellent, really, really well done. I think doing the social prescribing team and community hubs so quickly and redesigning them and doing that whole system is is really, really well done. Um, we know we've got problems with recruitment and to do all that work with the secure community forensic team is good as well to get the team in place in there. And again, there's the good news on the aspirant nurses that, that, that wanted to work with us and are going to stay with us. So I think there's a, a lot of really, really good news stories in there that uh, we need to keep on top of. I like the thing about um, the domestic abuse and putting a video blog together for that, because obviously that must be something that is rising at the moment under the present conditions. And I think my only question was around the provider collaborative. We've now appointed a post of programme leader. I just wondered who that was and what the background was. Pete, do you want to pick that up for us? Yeah, so we've made the appointment. It's an individual called Melanie Bradley. Bradbury, sorry, got my camera yeah. away this morning. I'm thinking of Matt Bradley at Yes, hi, hi. She currently works here as a commissioning manager at Hull CCG. She's got a lot of experience in mental health, particularly secure mental health, which works at North Yorkshire and York. She's joining us on the 11th of June, so we managed to negotiate to start in her early. And I think, well, I just can't wait for her to start, Francis, so we can start to actually, you know, get this business case pulled together and put the capacity in that we need. Excellent, thanks. Uh, that will be a really good appointment. Um, she, you know, she's been um, in the in the system and commission system for a long time, and has worked at, across the patch. We did have applicants. So it was a it was a, a proper interview yeah. um, process. Vis a vis, we had some, some strong candidates, so that's good. Um, the current program is suspended from NHS England, but we're pushing the centre to recommence that, and there is um, a lot of. Um, favour to do that. Um, so we'll keep you posted. Obviously, we were going to go shadow form from October. We'll still probably do that in some guys, but at the moment, the data coming through for the due diligence has been a little bit scared. Uh, bit, bit... We are pushing them at the moment. I had a conversation with Matthew Broom, the regional director, yesterday, just to start to say that we need to start to get some of that information. So we're on that now, Francis. And I think as we start to turn you know, turn into phase two, which is normal business in a COVID world. I think we'll see that moving a bit more. Great. OK, thank you. Anything else? Yeah, Sharon, it's, it's Peter. Can I just ask one one uh, quick question on the Clinical Excellence Awards? It's something I've been involved in in the past, and it's always we've always tried to um, to give the awards based upon uh, like a meritocracy system. So, you know, if a clinician, a doctor went the extra mile, then they got the award. And I just was a bit um, confused what, what it meant by that they were going to be shared equally. Um, you know, is everybody going to get like a, a part of an award? I mean, how, what, does that, what does that mean? And how does that sort of inspire clinicians to sort of go the extra mile if, if, everybody, if everybody's sort of going to get, get an award? Michelle, would you like me to, yeah, have yeah. a chance of us? I do, but I have said that we need a formal paper to the board as well, Peter, just to just to sign it off. We did have a conversation at the executive management team and make a decision on Monday, but um, I have suggested that we put a formal paper to the board. But John, do you want to give an update as to where we're at? Well, yeah, I, I think, um, Peter, that this isn't our decision. This is a decision which has come down from the BMA and the NHS employers. 
Um, so while I would agree with you, and actually while our consultant body would have agreed with you about it, a meritocracy process is something which, um, because of the COVID situation, has come down from the centre. So um, there are pros and cons of this approach. Um, we'll all have our views, but, but ultimately that's what has been decided centrally and mandated to us. Um, but we will bring something um, you know, through the committees just to outline what that means in, in practice. Okay, so just in terms of time scale on that, John, um, I won't keep you to it, but what indicative time scale we're looking for it to get to the board? Uh, I, I just need to check when the next workforce and OD committee is, just to get the timelines. Um, but there's still some formal guidance we're, we're still waiting for it to come down from the centre. One or two conversations we need to have with the LNC to agree with it, um, and okay. then we'll take it for board for approval in the normal way. Okay, we'll pick it up as an action then, Jenny. Thank you for that suggestion. Um, is there anything else on that? Uh, Sharon, could I just uh, just put give a bit of context to the safeguarding section? You can, a, a lot of information in there, just um, giving the board some assurances around everything that we're doing. Um, in a national picture, domestic abuse online searches have increased by 350%. Support line access has increased by 54%. Substant substantial rise in um, self-referrals to child line and an increase of 50% in multi-agency domestic abuse referrals. Now, we're not seeing that in this area, which is concerning in itself. Hopefully, that, that's because it's not it's not at that level, but then there might be, there's lots of hidden, and obviously, we're not actually physically seeing some of our patients as well. So, it's all, all of what we're doing with the safeguarding team is absolutely trying to give everybody's awareness to this, keeping them very focused on it and trying to make sure that nobody loses sight around the safeguarding agenda. Thank you, Hilary. Yes, it's very informative. Thank you. You're right. There is a lot in there, but it, it's really good to read and it's very comprehensive. So thank you for the update. Anything else on the report? Um, just because he's on the line, can I congratulate Lee on his um, being invited to join the um, Humber Coast and Vale uh, management team for digital leadership. So well done, Lee. Um, reflection of everything that you're doing, so that's really good. And just before we close on this, can I just um, check that all board members are in agreement with um, Michelle's suggestion about the independence governance review being delayed? Is everybody happy with that? Yeah. yeah. Yep. No essential. Thank you. So we'll yeah. record that. Thank so you. thank you. If we can move on to item eight, which is the publications report, Michelle. Thanks, Chair. Um, again, people have had sight of this. Again, a lot of the publications have, have been slightly reduced because of COVID. We do get a lot of it, a lot of communications actually through the COVID central channel. And we are documenting those and we're going to have a potential audit trail for those. Um, so we will see where they've come in, where we've sent them to and what action has been done with them. But these are others that do actually do link into uh, the pandemic, but are slightly different. So it's just there for information, Chair, and we've got the director comments underneath but I'll, I'll let me out to questions. Thank you very much, Michelle. Questions for Michelle? No? Okay, thank you. Can we move on to item nine, which is the performance report, Pete? Thank you, Chair. So this is the first part for the new financial year, so obviously a performance. You'll notice that commentary is not included for the indicators, but for those that are outside normal variation, we've included commentary on the front sheet. I think if we take the report as read and just move straight into questions from members. Thank you, Pete. Questions on the performance report? Just before we go into questions, Sean, could I just comment on the social staffing dashboard? Um, there is a, an error around the sickness on there uh, for some of the teams. They're showing as 0%. Um, pick that up. Obviously, when the report was run, that was what was showing. I think it's because it's been run a bit earlier with the board meeting earlier. We have actually got the updated figures now for the sickness, and I'm uh, afraid that none of them are 0%. Um, I got this. This came through yesterday. So this was the latest figures. Um, Every, every one of them is a little bit uh, more than last month, with the exception of Inspire, which has come down. We, I can send those figures out after the board so that everybody can see those, and we've certainly updated the report now, so it will go in the public domain with the updated figures in. Thank you, Hilary. So we'll do that, Jenny. If we could just circulate them after the board to the board members and um, update the public papers, that would be helpful. Thank you for that, Hilary. Can anybody um, hear me? Yes, we can, Mike. Uh, sorry, I've had, just had a problem. I've been trying to get in for ages and thought you were ignoring me. There's something going on with the sound. Could, it, could, I, could I go back, please, um, to the Chief Ex report? 
A uh, couple of questions. I've got clinical excellence in my diary covering for you, Sharon, next Tuesday. Um, is that off now? John? Yes, Mike, apologies. Uh, that's no problem, that's no problem. And the other one is uh, terminology in um, chief section four. You've got electro... We're losing you again, Mike. Mike, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Sorry, Mike, we can't hear you. Mike, do you want to put a message in the message box? Yes, just put a message in the message box and we'll come back to it, Mike. If you, in put, the meantime, if you put a question in the message box, Mike, we can, we can answer it that way. Okay, in the, in the meantime, can we just move back to the performance report then? Um, any questions on the performance report? Sharon, if you, if you want to stay on the dashboard, Sure, Hilary, Hilary, you just mentioned it, you jogged my memory that uh, I had a couple of questions on it. Um, I mean, well done in, in getting all this together. I think one or two things which, which stand out for me is um, the occupation rate for Inspire at 159%, I think that might need an explanation. And also the, um, the clinical hours per patient per day at Pine View and at Ooze Wards. Um, which seem low, you know, for the for the um, med for the medium and for the low secure units there. So perhaps um, you could either get back to me later, or, or if if you can explain those now. I can certainly in, uh, explain Inspire. Um, that is because they did the bed occupancy still on four beds when actually it had gone up to nine beds, and that has actually been corrected as well in the updated report. Right. Thank okay. you. Yeah. And on Pine View. Pine View has been no more than 50% occupied since yeah. it opened. So obviously that impacts on the uh, staffing requirements. That's actually something that Pete Beckwith and I have picked up, um, Peter, that we do need to reflect in this dashboard. Right. But that's clinical hours per patient per day, so the occupancy shouldn't, um, shouldn't affect that, should it? It could impact on it if you've got full rotor and low occupancy. That wouldn't that increase it? It would increase it, not decrease it. Yeah. So can we I have think, a look I at think that? We, we need to look at that one. Yeah. It's a good question, Peter. We'll take that as um, um something for the, to be circulated around the board as an answer after the board meeting. But thank, thank you. you. Mike Anything Cook else? Here. Mike? Mike Cook here. Yeah, I had two broader points. Um, it's really under that sort of recovery and restore language that's being used now as we're beginning to get through um, the first phase of COVID-19. The first one is around waiting times. And I just would welcome some comment on things like IAP, where we're using technology more. Uh, you know, what, what is happening? Uh, are we likely to see some productivity gain or a restart of, of those to get on top of the CAMs and the uh, quite large waiting lists. Uh, the second bit about recruitment pipeline, just noting the vacancy numbers now, which are going up a little, uh, and I'm sure Dean and, and Steve will cover it under the HROD um, uh, section, but uh, they're the two areas, waiting times and recruitment pipeline, I suppose. They seem to be the key areas we need to be look, thinking about. Thank you, Mike. I was going to ask about waiting times as well. Lynn, could you start us off, please? Yeah, certainly. So, um, good, good questions. Obviously, this um, reflects activity in terms of waiting times in April, where we did deliberately stand down some of our, our non-urgent um, activity. Um, that actually overall we did very little of that, but there is some contribution therefore in terms of waiting times. Um, in relation to that. Um, the question about IAPT, and it's obviously come up um, in the earlier conversation around um, digital use in primary care, we had planned any way to expand the rollout of digital platforms in IAPT um, at this time of year. So we've introduced a new platform for us, which is called Silk Cloud. Um, some people might have heard of it. So we've actually increased access to that so, um, therefore, our expectation is, is the take-up of that should really support 
and the continuing work we're doing around access waiting times to uh, to IAPS. They were impacted this month. Actually, we didn't stand down any of the IAPS activity, understanding that COVID in its own right will have an impact on mental health and well-being, but we did see our DNA rates rise. Um, so that's something that we're examining now. Uh, there already is some improvement in that, so, um, so that's good. Um, in terms of CAMS waiting times um, as well, as we know, the biggest contributor to that um, is our autism diagnostic. Um, waiting time. There already are um, some digital um, platforms to support diagnosis and we've expanded the use of those already and also learning from those platforms what we can actually deliver ourselves more digitally. So we've already got improvement programs in place to um, change elements of those pathways. Um, but obviously um, because of the situation with um, schools being closed, and that has impacted on that waiting time too. But as Mike has already said, um, all of this work is very much part of our phase two programme that we really want to make sure that we're um, providing um, all of our services in such a way that we're anticipating increased demand across some of them. We did see a short term sort of reduction in referrals for some areas as well. So we know that that has stored up some um, demand too. So all of our work at the moment is modelling that capacity that we need to put in place to um, to address that. Can I just come back? I, I think when it when it's possible, it will be good to look at two things. One on the IAP side is the efficacy of the interaction and the quality of the therapeutic relationship. It, it doesn't necessarily work down the phone or on the screen for everybody. Uh, no. I think we covered that in the primary care. Uh, um, uh, and the second one is it would be good to think, right, well, what are the new trajectories post-COVID or during this, the, 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 the longer phase of COVID um, so we can understand them and, and, and set some expectation with the public and really get that PPI engagement back so that we understand what is working and what's not and, and, and promote what is and, and, and reduce what's not. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I had an interesting conversation with one of the staff governors who works in the IAP service that reflects a lot of what Mike's just alluded to. So it would probably be worth you picking it up with Craig as well, um, Lynn, just direct from the front line. So, um, OK, any other questions on the performance report? Hi, Chair. It's, it's Francis. Um, Hi, Francis. I had the same kind of questions as Mike around RTT, etc. Uh, but a couple of other points. Um, just a couple, well done to people on the training, because despite what's going on, training seems to have held up reasonably well, which is good to see. Um, the second point was around the clinical supervision, which again seems to be dipping. I'm guessing that's down to COVID, and I, I recognise that, but we just need to be aware that that's uh, dipping down. Um, Again, a well done on surveys completed where patients felt they were involved in their care. After that dip back in January, it's really picked back up and, it, and seems to be holding its own, which is well done to the team. Uh, and also um, the indicator on CPAs in terms of seven day discharges again. And good to see. So whilst, whilst I agree with Mike on some of the issues, there's some good stuff in there to acknowledge in terms of what's been going on in difficult conditions. Thank you, Francis. Um, anything else from anybody else? I know we've got Mike Smith back with us now. He's been texting me his progress, so um, he's back with us. Anything from anybody else in the performance report? Then we'll come back to your question on the Chief Exec's report, Mike. Oh, can I just talk about Michelle, can I just pick up Francis' point about clinical supervision? Because I think it's a good one. We have stressed and, and doing quite a lot of work on clinical supervision because, especially at this time, it's, I mean, it's, it's important at any time, as we know, and it is a, a priority for the quality committee, etc. But we really have to keep a really close eye on the, the, the quality and the, the time and the numbers of, of, of clinical supervision. And I think it might be something for the, I'm sure the quality committee have got in their sites just to do a, a, a bit of a more of a deep dive on. Because I think it's, it's really important, even in these unprecedented times, because people are working in slightly, a lot of different ways, as we've heard this morning, but in different environments as well. So it's even more important than it already is, and it's important before. Thank you, Michelle. Hilary, um, can you pick that up with Mike Cook for the Quality Committee? Yes, we'll do. Thank you. We'll take that. Um, I think, Dean, I think you wanted to come in. 
Yeah, it's just a similar sort of observation to Francis, really. I suppose uh, just looking at the performance report in the round, and uh, you know where services as um, uh, you know have held up, or where we have seen some sort of deterioration. Uh, in the context of what we've been going through, I, these are a surprisingly good set of, uh, I think, indicators, and just uh, recognising the hard work that we've got in, uh, you know, by managers and staff to be delivering that um, while they've been redesigning services, dealing with a sort of level four uh, incident, all the uncertainty, the levels of staff sickness absence, and those that are self-isolating, and uh, you know, whilst you know areas of concern are things to look at, I think in the context of where we've been. Um, I, I, I think a really sort of good set of, uh, uh, of reports from people uh, showing some of the, uh, the effort that's gone into uh, looking after our patients. Thank you, Dean. Anything from anybody else? Yes, yeah, I've, I've got, got one at a time. Who was that? Mike. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. Thank you. It's on performance report. Um, front cover sheet, unless anyone's already asked about it. The, the cash figure is at 28.834 on that report. Is it, it's at 25 through the rest of the report. So what's the correct figure, Pete? Pete, Beckwith? Sorry, I'm sorry. I was on mute, but I think I must have said that about a thousand times in the last four weeks. It's 25.8, Mike. I think it's a typo on the front. Good spot. Apologies, I missed it. Yeah, okay, no problem. Thank you. Just on the cash, I think we do need to be reticent, and I know we put it in the commentary, that the architecture of the NHS gave us an additional month's block. So within that is 9.8, which is our block income for May. So at some point, the board needs to be expecting that our cash figure will reduce back to its underlying position, which still was 16, which is not unhealthy from where we were 18 months, 24 months ago. That's, that's fine. It's just a shame that we don't get any interest on it. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else, Mike Smith? No, thank you. I'll, I'll go back to Chief Exec in a minute. Yeah, we'll get to the end of the performance report first. Um, sure. Anybody got anything else on the performance report? John, was, do you want to come in? Yeah, thank you. It, it was about the cash again. Pete, in terms of the turbulence around the, the cash position, how long do you think of, you know, this kind of position with the block is going to sort of take its way to um, level itself out to get back to baseline? Um, any... It's a, a really good question, John. If I'm brutally honest, I don't have the answer because okay. it's not come out in the guidance, but I would expect it would be a slow reduction. I can't see with the NHS and, and the need for cash and the cash to flow that they'll just suddenly say, we're not going to fund the block contracts in March or one month this year. I, I would expect there'll be a tapered recovery of the cash that injected into the system. Okay, thank you. That's, that's just my estimate of what might happen. Okay, thank you, John. Thanks, Pete. Anything else on the performance report? No? Okay, thank you very much for that. Got some good questions, good debate. Um, Michelle, is it all right if we just move back to your chief exec report? Mike Smith, you've got a question? Yeah, it was just on the terminology um, that Michelle had referred to elective conductive therapy. Uh, is that new terminology for electroconvulsive or is it a typo? So I'm just going backwards. It's probably more than a typo, especially if it says that. Yeah, I, I, I googled it and nothing came up. It, it, it's only a minor thing, but I just wondered for my own education if the terminology had changed. That's fine. Thank no, you. No, no, it's not. It's elect yeah, it is elective conductive therapy, ECT. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. If we could move on, please, to item 10, which is the finance report, Pete. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So this is the report as at the end of April, so first month of the new financial year. I guess the key points I'll pull out from the report and then I'll move to questions are we recorded a break-even position for month one, which is what was the ask of the trust, given that we haven't got a approved financial plan, given the suspension of operational planning. I guess key points within that position is we included a month one COVID claim for our revenue expenditure of 539000 so that would have to go through the routes. We've talked about cash, so I won't draw that one out. The majority of the income in the position was based on the current arrangements with Block. We have been advised that that arrangement will continue till October, but we're still seeking clarity on whether there'll be any form of true up or reconciliation, or it will just then move to business as usual from October. And you'll note from the report, we put a provision into the position to reach break even. And part of that was linked to the uncertainty on the arrangements of block and the risk of our COVID claim not being fully reimbursed. 
and I'll stop there and I'm happy to move to questions. Okay, thank you very much, Pete. Um, questions for Pete on the finance report? No. Um, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll ask one, uh, Chair, if that's all right. Just on, on the income side, um, Pete, you've got like 1.2, nearly 1.3 million of benefit in the month. Based on, on this block arrangement, is that something, I know, I know you've made provisions against it, etc., like you've just explained, but is that something which you'd expect to be of that sort of level every month now till maybe October at least, that sort uh, of benefit to income? Potentially, Peter, we're just unpicking the block at the moment. So some of the income in month also had some cash and put invoicing, which is now seized. And also, don't forget, 600 of that, the nearest damn it, was the COVID claim, which wasn't budgeted. Yeah. So I guess what I would say is, I, I, I won't dive into detail now, but we'll be bringing a detail breakdown for obviously Finance and Investment Committee this month. Where hopefully, there'll be, I mean, we're expecting some planning guidance out in the next couple of weeks, apparently. So hopefully that might inform what the future looks like. Right, okay, that's a good position then. Yeah. There's a lot There's a lot of conversation as well, sorry Pete, about mental health investment standard and that's where important. that sits. Um, so yes, we are expecting some update in the next couple of weeks, but we are. I am picking it up nationally in relationship to mental health investment standard funding, because uh, that's not actually identified in the block at the moment. Um, so I'll pick that up with you a, a bit later, but we are, um, trying to ascertain what the block means going forward, um, especially in relationship to the mental health component. Thank you. I was going to ask that question, Michelle, so you've answered my question on that one. That's fine. Has anybody else got any questions on the finance report? No. No. Um, I've just got one, Pete. Um, it's just on expenditure. Obviously, we're over budget by 200,000. Is is that COVID or is that any, what, what is that? Predominantly COVID, Sharon. It's the COVID expenditure that obviously we haven't put a budget in at the end of April. Okay, thank you. Anything else before we move on? No, thank you. If we can move on to item 11, which is the Mental Health Legislation um, Assurance Report, Mike Smith. Mike, are you with us? Yeah, sorry, mute again. Um, there is just one thing on page 74, I think it was, it's just a minor one. It said um, we're going to agree the term, agreed terms of reference will be updated and refresh membership should read the mental health terms of reference have been updated. And it's just some changes to the membership in terms of um, adding um, full fee on, um, Kwame on, sorry, um, and also um, the, the safeguarding rep. Thank you, Mike. Questions? For, uh, John, do you want to add anything before I go to questions? Uh, no, happy to take questions. Okay, questions for John or Mike? No, thank you. It was a good report. Thank you. Uh, moving on, item 12, the Workforce and Organisational Development Assurance Report. Dean? Sorry, also coming off uh, uh, mute. Uh, yes, thanks very much. Uh, uh, for that, uh, the, the report is there. Happy to take any sort of uh, questions on it. Uh, I guess the, um, the, the, the the main substance of the discussion really was just looking at the uh, the risks around uh, recruitment and retention and, uh, and turnover, and whether the mitigating actions that we are taking are appropriate. And we've asked the executive team just to have a, a look at that um, in the context of um, what we'd like to do really is. Um, given lots of good activity that's been taking place in terms of uh, dealing with uh, uh, recruitment of, uh, of staff. It's just having a look about what a, an investment plan might look like uh, to make further inroads into the future. So more work for the committee, uh, but happy to take any sort of questions. Thank you. Uh, Dean, Steve, anything you want to add? Uh, nothing to add really, Sharon. I think that covers it off. It was um, a really good uh, meeting done via Skype. I think we covered off and we, we, we got the things that we needed to, to talk about and hopefully we'll be able to bring that back as Dean says to the next particular meeting. Okay, just um, for my benefit, when's the Quality, Diversity and Inclusion Report coming to the board? Is it next month? Yep, yeah, it comes to June. That's great, thank you. Anything on that? Any questions for Steve or for Dean? No, thank you very much again, um, and thank you for turning that around so quickly. Um, can we move on to item 13, the COVID uh, response update, Lynn? Yes, thanks, Chair. 
So at last month's board, you had a paper in relation to the governance arrangements in place um, since um, COVID commenced. So this paper is probably more of an operational um, paper, just to provide an update. Um, the paper starts with the sort of key issues that were set out in a letter from um, Simon Stevens and Amanda Pritchard from NHSE. I'm really sort of um, thinking about that whilst we might be through the peak in terms of hospital admissions nationally, that obviously COVID is going to remain with us and the requirements across sort of health and social care sector in terms of how we sort of move into now what's being um, described as sort of phase two, sort of restore, recover um, elements of COVID. So just going through sort of the key points um, in the paper, um, we've maintained our um, emergency planning arrangements, um, our commands arrangements. We've slightly reduced the frequency um, of the sit rep um, meetings, but the daily reporting um, remains in place. Obviously, we continue to um, work within the um, plans described in our business continuity plans. Key to the um, plans, obviously, is the availability of staff um, in relation to um, impact of COVID on their the graph in the paper sort of demonstrates that we did have a peak. We do appear to be past that peak of staff absences. It has reduced and it has stabilised. Um, so that's um, very encouraging. We have maintained all of our essential core services um, through the um, emergency so far. We did see some reduction in demand and activity across some of our service areas. So, for example, um, CAMS community services, we saw a reduction of um, around 45% um, from mid-March um, through April. But that demand is starting to rise again. In fact, in some of our mental health services, we're seeing sort of um, above our usual levels of activity now over the last couple of weeks, um, which I'll come back to that as we um, talk through the sort of key points. Um, obviously, in relation to um, patient and staff testing, that's continued to be a focus for us um, since the last report. We now are testing all of our inpatients in line with national guidance on admissions to our inpatient areas. And we're also testing them on transfer between units too. Um, staff testing, uh, we continue to have that provided in the main from Hoft on the Holony Sliding um, part of the patch and um, York Hospitals on the north part. Uh, and that's working well overall. There is some variation in timings of results, um, but not a great deal. Obviously, we continue to be focused on PPE supply and we um, remain in a good position in relation to that. But the work that um, Hillary and the operational team now are putting in place um, I guess a plan to make that sustainable going forward as well and some extra resource to um, to manage that. But by and large, that's working well. Um, continue to obviously to maintain a, maintain a focus on um, staff health and well-being through all of this too. So um, and that that's really important. Um, we have strengthened the approach that we've taken around um, assessing those staff that are at higher risk. Um, there's been a lot of focus nationally around our BAB um, staff group too. So we've put in place measures to, um, to address that need um, as well. Uh, obviously, we maintain a focus on wherever possible. That's in discussions. Sorry, Lynn, you keep breaking up a little bit. Sorry, Lynn, you keep breaking up a little bit. Lynn, I haven't you can have any. Could you perhaps turn your video off? We're just losing you a bit. Hello? Is that any better? Yeah, yes, yeah. thank you. Sorry, I haven't trust HQ. <laughs> so just talking about staff health and wellbeing, hopefully you heard about that. The work that we're doing around continuing to risk assess um, staff in the high risk groups, um, particularly focusing obviously on our phase two planning now. What changes have we made that are transformational? And um, that they need to remain in place, but particularly around thinking about the focus on we're 
anticipating obviously a rise in demand for mental health services, already seeing that um, in some areas. Obviously, nationally, it's been focused around um, health support into the care home sector, particularly. So, this work taking place with our services in Scarborough, Rydale, and um, Whitby to look at what more, and we've already made some changes to our services there. Um, but obviously, our mental health services also have a part to play um, in that. So, and um, that planning is well underway um, at, at the moment. And I guess just for me, just acknowledgement again, as we've said already. Um, just how fantastic our staff have been, that they really have stepped up and supported um, the changes that we've needed to make uh, and done that at pace. And again, the collaboration between clinical and corporate teams, um, we wouldn't have been able to be in the position that we are without that working well. So happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you very much, Lynn. Questions for Lynn on the paper? Chair, can I just add, add a, just a couple of other pieces? Obviously, this is a moving um you know moving face it's changing constantly just a little bit about the recovery piece um i think lynn touched on it that and, and thanks to lynn and her leadership of this has been has been great um but we are also doing a lot of work with care homes i think we've touched on that but there is a real push on um care home plans local resilience forum plans um etc for, for both north yorkshire and york and, uh, and the Humber end, and I think we're trying to work through that at the moment to see what that means in relationship to staffing, infection control support, um, et cetera. So that's a real key piece. We touched on earlier, I'll pick up the resilience ones probably later, but we touched on earlier about working from home. There's a lot of staff working from home still. We've made it really clear that we're going to continue that process uh, for, for, for an indefinite period at the moment until we can get into a more um, safe environment with COVID. So Steve is working on a policy for working from home. But we're also looking at how we utilise Trust HQ, but how we work with meetings and have some real good guidance on meetings, keeping that two metres apart. So I think there's a lot of other work going on as well that we've alluded to that we'll obviously keep the board up to date with. But really for us, the key theme is carry on those services, transform the services, but keep doing what we're doing in relationship to working from home. And I know that's difficult for some staff, but but we, we have a you know, duty, as we're aware, to, to keep our staff safe and our community safe so um, we're also looking at um, resilience hubs so there's been a lot of talk about how we support the general population um, but also the, the population of key workers and that's not just health and social care there's key workers that have been in transport key workers that have been in supermarkets so from an, an integrated care system point of view we're looking at resilience hubs now whether we end up having one or two we're in the, the discussions at the moment about doing that. Now, we know that really good things have gone on at place in relationship to supporting staff. We've done a lot in the organisation, but we need to bring that together to support um, the communities on a wider basis. So we're looking at resilience hubs. What was interesting, I did an MP forum with, with Lynn and, and at Kwame on Tuesday, Monday night, and a lot of it was geared around CAMS and children and young people and not just um the the, ch the, the mental health and well-being of, of children and young people but but that how the parents felt about the, the children going to school so well, there is a piece of work that we need to to really do about how we support that and the transition back to school so i'm sorry about that chair i just thought i'd put a little bit more yeah, it's in helpful. that that inclusiveness really but uh, but but as i say it, there, there's been a lot of and i think the word we used earlier on was proactive we've been very proactive we've been ahead of, of 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 what we've been doing and we'll continue to do that and a lot of our practices um, and a lot of the work that we're doing has, has, is now being used nationally which is really great thank you just before we move to questions lynn it did um it has been picked up before by the non exec and the governors could you just give us a brief outline it doesn't need to be specific details but of the sort of numbers um, that we're currently experiencing uh, in connection with patients and staff in terms of numbers affected by covid Sharon. yes yes, yes. sorry <laughs> so in our, our inpatient areas the highest number of covid positive patients that we reached at any one time was 19 right. so and then we're at um, i think it's actually just four um, COVID positive patients today, and it has been um, decreasing 
um, since that peak of 19, which was about two weeks ago. And our, our staff rates, um, obviously we've got around sort of four and a half to five percent is where we're sort of um, stabilised at the moment. Now, not all of those staff will have tested positive, uh, but they might be um, isolated because there's a family member with symptoms. So, but, but it's a fairly stable static position that we've got to with that at the moment. Thank you, Ellen. That's helpful. Right, questions for Sharon. Ben. Hello. Oh, yes, sorry, Sharon. Just, just in numbers terms. So we have 18 staff off with COVID-related sickness at the minute, and 103 that are self-isolating. Just to put some numbers to what Lynn's, Lynn said from that, just to detail. Thanks, Dave. That's helpful. Um, any questions on the paper? Hi, Sharon. It's, it's Francis. Just, just to start off by saying thanks very much. A very comprehensive paper and even more comprehensive uh, additions to that from Lynn and from Michelle. A couple of, of minor ones. In terms of patient and staff testing and taking on board Michelle's comment about being part of the wider community. What, what's that like for everybody, not just us, but for care homes and everything else in the, in the ICS? Uh, Lynn, could you answer that? In terms of care homes and the um, numbers of COVID positive residents, um, Francis, is that what the question no, was? All, all I'm asking is, is how easy is it for people, not just from the hospital, but in the community to get tested? To access testing. Yes. Yeah. So, 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 it's so, so obviously, the, um, that um, facility for um, testing, obviously, beyond the hospital, has now been in place for a few weeks, which is great. So, um, that opportunity, therefore, is provided primarily through the drive through facilities. So there's one at Humber Bridge, um, there's one in York um, at a um, park and ride at Poppleton as well. And there has been some remote testing facilities available too at various places at various points as well. So um, now through the local resilience forums, um, staff testing for um, the wider health and social care um, groups um, is being reported regularly. So it does feel like that has moved on um, significantly. Um, there has been some capacity issues from time to time, and those are still being looked at across the system. Um, but it is an improving position overall. And the focus now is on the next pillar of testing, that test, track and trace. So we haven't got an absolute timeline for when that will come on stream. Um, but we expect that to, to be in place in the next few weeks. Um, so that will, you know, help and make a difference too. I think, as, as Lynn says, the access to, to testing is not necessarily so much of the problem now. It's the capacity to do the actual testing and the result, uh, the results of the, of the test that we're working on at the moment to see how we can maximise lab capacity. Because the majority of the labs that we're using across the ICS are maxed. Um, so it's about how we can I increase that capacity. Um, Phil Metton now has the chief exec lead for um, test, track and trace. Um, so we'll there's a set up a small working group to say how we can do that as a system with obviously the public health departments, which are obviously responsible for the, the contract tracing. So that will be developed over the next couple of weeks. Uh, what is interesting is I'm sure you're aware that Dido Hardin is the national lead for um, testing alongside Sarah Jane Marsh. And Tom Riordan is the um, lead, obviously from Leeds, which is great because it's in the, our area for the tracing piece. So um, that will obviously continue to be to be pushed out. Obviously, there are other aspects like blood serology as well, but we still don't know where that is up to. Um, so um, testing, OK, capacity is still an issue. Thank okay, you, uh, both. Two, two other questions for me. One was on section eight on the planning, recovery and restore. Really good that you, you're working with the divisions to capture what's stopped, what's delivered differently, etc. Any big issue, any big wins come out of that? Anything that we should be aware of? Um, quite a lot, I think, um, <laughs> Francis. And I think we've touched on a bit of that around sort of the primary care piece earlier. But the use of digital, which to be fair, is probably in our transformational plans anyway. Um, but the fact that we've actually achieved that at pace, I think the points that were raised earlier about um, the pros and cons of that is starting to come through 
as well. But in some areas where you might not have expected digital to work so well in terms of uh, video consultations, so for example, learning disability services, actually, it's, it's some, some elements of that are working really positively. Um, because we can actually have contact in some areas actually more frequently, so more activity, but more, you know, more productivity, I guess, I guess is where we're up to with that. So some real good positive stories um, around that. And as we heard this morning, you know, some staff who have reflected now as well that they didn't think that it would be possible to deliver some of these clinical activities, interventions in this way have really had their horizons broadened around that. So and I'm really talking very positively about it. So I think there's a lot to, to be really positive about. Um, through the transformational changes that we've made. So um, too many to actually um, comment on um, in, in the board, but, but that's very much the focus of the, the detailed planning that we're doing now. It's really important that is supported by modelling work um, for the reasons that we've already touched on as well. And digital isn't the answer to everything. So we are now stepping up some of the contact where it needs to be. And in the paper as well, obviously, it talks about the clinical environment work that we're needing to do to make sure that all of our clinical areas accommodate the infection control requirements, social distancing, the need to be working in PPE for a longer period of time um, as well. But but I think, you know, a lot to be sort of, you know, proud of and really want to sustain um, going forward. Thanks, Lynn. And, and you, you made two points in there, which industry is looking at in quite a big way, which is productivity and quality. So, so everyone's saying how good virtual working is, but the, you, the, the industry is looking to say, well, over a long period of time, we just need to sense check that the productivity is still right and the, and the quality is still right. Because everyone's saying how great it is, but we, we, we need a bit of long-term research really to understand the impact. And, and going back to something we mentioned earlier, I know we did a lot of training in my old company when we started getting people to work from home. From home and, and how you put your day together and family and all that kind of stuff. I'm assuming that will be a lot longer. Thing, really. can, sorry, can I just interrupt? Can we just put our um, members put um, on mute when we're not um, talking? Because there's quite a lot of background noise going on, I think. Um, but thank you. Sorry, Lynn, carry on if you want to say anything else. Sorry, Steve, do you want to pick up that bit about working from home? Because obviously you've got, you're pulling that policy together. Um, and I know that we you're actively involved in staff side, which is a great idea. So do you want to give us just a, a, a thoughts about how that's going? Yeah, I can do. I mean, obviously, we've had people who have worked from home prior to COVID. We had those sort of arrangements. They tended to be more informal. So what we want to try and do is just put something in in place that kind of wraps around some of the informal arrangements that have taken place and we've been working with, but formalises it a little more so that people are really sure about what they can get. And that's both support for them in how we give them that kind of um, emotional, psychological, team-based supervision support, but also some of the more physical aspects. So, you know, some of the equipment and kit type of conversations that we need to have. And we kind of pull that together and have that really clear about what our offer is. Um, so, yeah, we're in the process of pulling that together. We're looking at what's out there, what sort of industry best practice and um, as Michelle mentioned, I'm working with Paddy from staff side who equally they've got some really good ideas and good examples and we'll look to bring something through in the next few weeks on that to firm it up and be clear about what our offer is to staff. So really important that we do that kind of now, um, although that's working well and that's the feedback we've got from our staff side. Um, but if we're looking to do this longer term, I think it's clear it's important that we have that clarity. Uh, Sharon, I wonder if I could just... Uh... Just pick up as well. Just, um, I mean, again, to welcome the uh, the report from uh, Lynn and the comprehensive updated all work that's going on, and I guess that sort of sense now moving into you know a further set of interim arrangements before what be, might become a new, um, you know, a new normal, a new sort of business as as, as normal. Uh, but but just something coming out, I think, about the, the sort of evidence about workplaces really, the differences between those workplaces where they were able to close and then reopen and those workplaces where they've remained open and, and adapted. And uh, I think what people are sort of sensing is that uh, where people have had the, the benefits. Oh, we've, we've lost you there, Dave. Oh. You've gone, Dean. We've, lost, we've gone, lost you, Dean, I'm afraid. Speaks about virus from me. 
<laughs> well, while we're waiting for Dean to come back, there was one final question, which was around the, the national ethical framework, which looks great. I presume we're cross-referencing that with our own ethics committee. John? John Byrne, you there? I we seem to have lost John. Um, we'll just pause that one for now, Francis. We'll get an answer shortly. Has anybody got anything else they want to ask, Lynn or Michelle? Yeah, Sharon, it's Peter here. Can I just, um, yeah, I know I've asked it before, about, but what, is there any view about what the longer term or medium to longer term um, requirement is for the Nightingale Hospital in, in Harrogate? I know, I know it's currently sort of not in use, but um, if the, is it going to be staying there maybe for, in case there's a second peak or, or is it going to be um, stood down? You know, what, you know, what, what's the medium term position on, the, on that uh, to your knowledge? I think at the moment there's no clear um, decision being made yet, Peter. Uh, the idea is that they're going to keep it there just in case there is a how, how high the second peak is. Um, and then take it from there. Um, but it, it's got a, it's got an extended lease anyway to the, to the NHS. So um, but it will be just as it is. And then they'll see if they may use it for other um, other cases, other conditions, as they're trying to play with some of the backlog from the acute sector. But at the moment, it's remaining where it is, just in case of the second peak for COVID. Yeah, sensible. Okay, thank you. Anything else, Peter? Sorry, Chair. I think Dean, it's a shame Dean's gone. So I think Dean was going to mention something about the, the, the estates and the facilities. Yeah. And we're doing quite a lot of work on that at the moment, or should I say Pete is. So it might be helpful at some point to pick that up maybe when Dean's back, because it's about how we reschedule the um, the, the, the room layouts of, of Trust HQ and others of our bases, which Pete and the team are on with doing. So maybe we do need to pick that up when Dean comes back. So I think that's, that's the, the way that question was headed. No, that's fine. I seem to have lost John as well um, from my list. So um, when John comes back, we'll also pick up um, Francis's question, if that's OK. In the uh, meantime, Sharon, I'm still here. The ethics framework, oh. I'm on that point. Uh, I'm involved with the ethics committee, as is Hillary. I thought our principles were very similar uh, when I looked at the national guidance, but we will, I'm sure, have a look at it uh, between us. But I, I was quite reassured that we were absolutely on the right lines. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. John, do you want to reply to Francis's question? I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that, Sharon. Uh, Francis, do you want to repeat your question? Well, I think John heard the question, and I think Mike's kind of answered it. I just was, was asking whether or not the National Ethical Framework was uh, feeding into our Ethics Committee, and, and Mike's kind of more or less answered it, unless you wanted to add anything, John. Thanks. I'm happy with Mike's response. Thank you. OK, thank you. OK, anything else on the paper? No? Uh, Dean, are you back with us? No? OK, well, we'll come back to... We work, we'll just um, keep Dean's comment um, live for now. So if we can move on to item 14, which is the quality accounts, Hilary. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, the annual report of quality against the mandated framework. Um, because of COVID, we have been informed that we don't actually have to publish until December. I think they were giving everybody more time to produce these accounts. But we were so on track with it and it had already been to the quality committee um, that we're, we're sticking with the timescales that, that, uh, that we originally had. Um, due to COVID, there'll be no auditing of the accounts this year. We've all been in, informed of, of that slight changes but as I say it's been to the quality committee and EMT so it's here really for the board to um, hopefully ratify today. Um, I think it's a very comprehensive report I think it gets better over year in terms of the content and what we're doing I feel very proud when I read it to see what the you know the trust and everybody in it has actually achieved from the quality perspective. All of our awards are in there provider of the year, uh, breastfeeding award, recognition uh, nationally of our patient involvement approaches and patient experience and obviously research as well. So just some of the highlights in there. Last year's quality priorities that the board um, agreed, they've, they've uh, all showcased in there as well and they've all been met. And page 102, which is really our successes, I just think that just reads better every, every year. 
Um, obviously, I open it to comments and get some feedback from the board on it. And and, and and once the board have ratified it, we do need to present it to the, to the governors. And we're trying to keep it on track so that it's published in a timely way. I, I personally feel December's far too far down the road. We'll be in a different place by then. So I'm glad that we've been able to get these um, to the where they are at the moment to be able to bring them to the board today. Thanks, Hilary. It is a, a fantastic piece of work. We'll come on to that. But could you, can you just explain to me, um, in terms of the, um, the approval from the board, obviously we need to give us, um, comply with a statement to direct those responsibilities, which yeah. is towards the back. And obviously some of that hasn't been done yet. So um, obviously the, camp, the Council of Governors hasn't been um, consulted yet. And I know we're waiting for some feedback. But can someone just fill us in on the head of internal audits opinion, which is one of the things we need to satisfy ourselves of before we um, ratify this? Uh, well, we got the draft head of internal audit opinion yesterday at the audit committee chair, and he gave good assurance. Okay. So how's it going to work, Hilary? If there are other suggested amendments, etc., if we've approved it, is it coming back? So that needs to go in. I can send. Uh, the we're hoping to get some comments back from the OSCs as well. We've chased the OSCs because I think that's really important to get their comments. Hull OSC have come back and said that they will try to get something to us in June when they next meet. We've not heard back from East Riding yet. So what I could do is bring back a paper that has the additional information in there. And uh, if that's like rather than bringing the full account back. Yeah, I think that's fine. But I think if the board's been asked to sign it off, but it hasn't sort of completed its yeah. process yet. Yeah. Um, but that's fine. Uh, Mike, I'll come to you as chair of quality committee, because I know that yeah. um, quality uh, committee uh, worked this on this. Our, this is our strongest quality count yet. Uh, I'm really pleased it's been done on time. We could have waited till mid-December to have this conversation. This is a relevant conversation because it's given us a great baseline to go into 2020. 21, a year when COVID has hit this country and wider, um, and I think we, we're resilient to, to do so because of the progress on quality assurance and quality improvement, which actually shines out of the document. So I think it's something we should be very proud of, uh, to have a quality account this good, having such uh, you know a fairly poor one when we first uh, started looking at them. Um, so uh, thank you for the work behind it. Uh, there is a little bit of updating to do in terms of opinions, but the work is there and it is it, 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 it is strong. Um, so I, I'm in a position where quality committee would commend and recommend this to the board, uh, subject to one or two final amendments, which we can, as Hilary suggests, give you from her and John as they come in. But I think it's a good document. Let's use it. Let's send it to the CQC. Uh, let's show that we're on top of our quality systems. Okay, thank you, Mike. Right, questions or comments on the paper, please. Hi, hi Chair, it's Francis. I'm just going to say, uh, you know, I support Mike. I think it's a really excellent report. I really like the style and the approach used. I think there's some great use of pictorials, which get better every day to tell the story. I think the patient stories are particularly poignant, and, and the, the one that we'd heard at board being in there, I thought was really, really good, particularly from the wife's perspective in terms of what she went through was great. I thought the comments from around the patch that we've got were very positive, with a couple of areas highlighted that obviously we need to pick up on that a couple of people have, have made. And I support Mike. I think the sooner we get this out, which shows the great work we've done. I wouldn't be waiting till December because, as Mike said, we'll be in a completely different world. We should be celebrating what we've done remarkably well and getting it out into general publication. It's, it's fantastic. Great, thank you. Anything else from anybody else? Chair, if I may, just to add that um, the quality account is normally appended to the annual report, which is presented in September. So that would be the last, the latest point. But you know, December is too far away. Um, but it will be appended anyway, um, and that the annual report is coming to the next board. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that, Michelle. Um, anything else? I've just got a few. No? Okay. Can I say, I, I think it is an excellent um, document. It's the best one I've seen in all the time that I've been at Humber, definitely. Um, I, and not only that, the presentation of it is fantastic. I do love the um, celebration sections and the month by month, what's been achieved. It just shows you how much work has gone on and how far uh, we've moved as an organisation. 
And I have to say the statements from the stakeholders, I know that we're waiting for some, but the ones that are in there are the strongest I've ever seen. And I've been on this board for quite a number of years. So um, well done to everybody um, and for all the work behind it, because obviously it reflects all the work that's gone on in the Trust, but it really is um, a good document. So Hilary, um, I'll ask the board in a minute if they're happy to approve it, um, but I do think we need to, um, can we please liaise with um, myself and Jenny about the governors yeah. and obviously yeah. chase up the missing ones. Yeah. If we could insert the detail about the, um, um, and we can make sure we minute about the internal audit um, draft opinion, that would be helpful. And then if you could just bring something, as you say, very brief back, or even in the chief exec's report in your section, um, yeah. If we could just detail um, any other comments from the governors and from the other stakeholders and any changes that are made. So on that basis, are the board happy to approve the quality accounts? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Any dissension? No. no. Thank, you. thank you, Hilary. Can you please thank the team? It's a massive piece of work um, and it's a great job. So really good. Thank you. Thank you. OK, we can move on to item 15, which is the committee effectiveness reviews. Uh, Michelle Hughes. Thank you, Chair. So the effectiveness reviews and the terms of reference have been provided by the chairs and exec leads and collated into one report. As you can see, the effectiveness reviews are all there and are a key part of good governance and being well led and have all been completed. Just a point, um, in collating the report, it was apparent that in terms of the terms of reference, there was some inconsistency in terms of format. Um, so. Um, once these have been presented by the committee chairs and approved in a moment or two, subject to board agreement, I'll consistency check them and ensure that without changing the um, agreed content, that all sections are consistent and then I'll return to the committee administrators to use as the master version. Things I'm talking about are things about the consistency of the purpose of the assurance to board and the minutes and reporting section. Um, but that's all um, in terms of consistency and I'll hand over to the uh, leads to present their own. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Yes, Michelle and I have had a discussion about this. I just think it's important for them to be all consistent, so if everybody's happy with that. Should we take them one by one then, please? So if we can um, deal with the first one, which is the quality committee. So um, Hilary, John, Mike, is there anything so, you want to add to what I kick off? I mean, we met six times, as asked, um, the CQC um, underlined our rating of overall good. I think we've done some really good work on patient safety, including the local launch of our own patient safety revised strategy. We've looked at quality improvement um, as, as core business and the clinical models for CAMS and mental health inpatients. I think uh, we've just talked about the strongest uh, quality account we've, uh, we've, uh, we've approved so far as an organisation. So um, I think the quality committee is in good shape. We're meeting again on the 18th of June um, and uh, I hope that you'll uh, recommend, I'd recommend the terms of reference and the continued programme of work we've got. I don't know whether Hilary and John want to add a little bit on to that. Anything to add? No, uh, nothing, nothing from me. I think it's, it's been a, a really good uh, meeting throughout the year and it's certainly added value to the quality agenda. I, I just, okay. just said, I think okay. it's been Okay, um, any questions help. on the assurance report? Go on, John. I was just going to say, I think there's been a helpful balance of looking out, um, as well as some internal focus as well in terms of providing assurance around um, what the outside world is saying about our services and stuff. So it's about getting that balance, and I think we've achieved that um, successfully over the past year. Thank you all very much. Any questions on the um, review of effectiveness or the terms of reference? No. Are we happy to approve the quality committee terms of reference? Yep. Yes. Okay. Let's move on then to the next one, which is. Um, I think it's the Charitable Funds, isn't it? Yeah. Charitable Funds Committee. So this is Pete and Mike Cook again. Again, I'll just give you an overview, if I may. We met five times during 1920. I think the biggest achievement was that £302,000 for the impact appeal. Um, I think that was well run. Uh, really has uh, facilitated the Inspire unit to uh, be better than it 
could have been uh, just with straight capital funding, although it's a lovely facility. Uh, we've given flexibility to the fund holdings and we've welcomed new staff. And I think what, what that has done has created an energy and I'm really pleased they are involved in the community and staff support for the COVID response. And I think the board awareness is, is, is moving up. We're going to have a slightly more ambitious work plan and some good indicators to track, uh, which Victoria and Pete, uh, Andy and others are working on. So, uh, you know, we'll look forward to a good year. Thanks, Mike. Pete, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I think Mike sums it up. I think the committee has moved on over the last 12 months. I think the introduction of the insight report has been really helpful. I think the unrestricting of the funds will help reduce that funding that our hands were a wee bit tied on. And I think, you know, looking forward to the meeting next month, that's coming up where we'll get a refresh of the operating plan for the year, which will probably be recast given the new world we're operating in. Thanks, Pete. Any questions on the effectiveness report or the terms of reference? No. 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 Are we happy to approve the terms of reference? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, can we move on? I think the next one is um, Ramco uh, Remuneration Committee. Um, there is an error. It's a virgin control. We don't know how it's got in, but the committee has not appointed two executive directors in the last year. That was a previous year, so apologies for that. Um, any questions on? I think Remco's had. Um, it's done its fulfilled its statutory functions. You can see the details there. We've dealt with executive terms, conditions, and pay. Um, so, really, any questions on the um, effectiveness report or the terms of reference? No. There's a couple of changes that have been detailed to the terms of reference. Are we happy to approve those? Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on. So the next one, which is the Mental Health Legislation Committee, uh, Mike Smith and John. Just finding the mute button. If I can go first, um, take it as read. A couple of highlights uh, that you, you might otherwise miss is that if you look at the attendance list, we've got Laura Sheriff from the CQC attending one minute, uh, one meeting. We'll continue to invite her. I think it's a good investment and shows transparency there. Um, and the other one is the work plan where within, I think it's section eight or section nine, I'm not going to turn the screen at the moment. Um, we actually try to take a forward look rather than just doing the tick box business as normal. We've looked at the implementation of the LPS, what legislative changes, if any, will come out of the Coronavirus um, Act 2020 and a couple of other items that, that we want to, to focus on. And we're also going to bring something to MHLC about audit as well, so that we're self-determining on audit uh, using the 10 days that have been allocated to us. Rather than having audit done to us, we're going to have audit done for us. Thanks, Mike. John, anything you wish to add? Uh, no, just to echo Mike's point, so I, I think it's just it's worth noting that um, we've been had that sort of crossover with quality committee and also audit committee because of the membership. So that it doesn't feel like it's a mental health legislation committee operating in isolation. Um, I feel it does link in well with other subcommittees of the board. Thanks, John. I think that's a really good point, and we've deliberately um, and put membership across the committee so that they do all join up. And I think you're right; it's a good point to make. It has worked extremely well throughout the last year, and hopefully will continue to do so. So, any questions on the review of effectiveness or the terms of reference for the Mental Health Legislation Committee? No. Are we happy to approve the terms of the reference? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. We move on to the next one, which is the Audit Committee. Peter, Peter, and Pete. Hi, hi, Chair. Yes, uh, we had a, we had a good year at the, at the audit committee again. Um, I think, in particular, it's been it's been good that the internal audit um, uh, review points, the, the the matters arising from the internal auditors, the clear up rate has, has been excellent, and I think the new system that the executives put in to sort of make sure that uh, that was done in a timely and, and more efficient manner has, has worked really well. So, thanks to the um, to, to Pete and, and Ian, his, his assistant, for, for doing that. Uh, have appointed or, or recommended 
helped to recommend the appointment of new external auditors during the year to the Council of Governors. So um, we're working now very well with uh, Mazar. So I think we, you know, for all the audit committee members, I think we'll, we'll think that's probably a, uh, an improvement so that we're getting in terms of the advice from external auditors and, and the buy-in. So I think that's been a, a good thing during the year. Um, the other thing that's changed this year, I think, is that we've taken over of the oversight of information governance. Um, so we've received reports from the information governance committee and, and um, taken over that responsibility, I think, from the quality committee. So that's that's um, had one or two teething problems, but that's now working well. And uh, we will receive an updated report from them at, them at the next um, next committee, I think. Um, it's just, um, just in terms of the report itself, um, work plan for 2021 at the moment that's ticked as no because when this was prepared the work plan hadn't gone to the audit committee the audit committee met yesterday and approved the work plan for 2021 so that can now be ticked as a as a yes um, on, on, on the effectiveness review um, in terms of the in terms of reference um, francis picked up um that the board assurance framework was was for the oversight of the audit committee, in which we do we do do that, and we do we do make sure it's on the committee rep, um, on on the committee agenda for every meeting. It wasn't on yesterday's committee uh, agenda, so we will be picking up as a special sort of dive um, in, into the next committee, which is in June, on the board assurance framework to make sure that so we are fulfilling our our function uh, and to make sure there are no gaps. I don't think there are. And I think between you know, the membership of the committees, like we did we discussed before, and the work done at the board and the audit committee, and all the on all the subcommittees of the board, that that is that is something which um, we get assurance for. But I think we're just going to have a bit of a dive into that at the next committee meeting to make sure that um, you know we fulfil our responsibilities and then we ourselves make sure that there are there are no gaps in that in that assurance. In terms of the terms of reference, a couple, a couple of minor changes. I think Francis was looking at these on, on the fourth page, um, where it says um, the, the committee will review the adequacy of, and then the second bullet there, halfway in, it says four refers. That's superfluous. That should be taken out. And on the next page, the um, we talk about the, um, the finance and strategy um, subgroup of the governors. I think that's now got a new title, so that needs to be changed to its current title. Uh, so apart from that, I think the terms of reference are there to be um, approved. Thanks, Peter. Pete, anything you wish to add? Yeah, I, I guess I'd echo Peter's point on the progress in terms of clearing up audit recommendations from where we were a year ago, I think. You know, I would on record thank Ian for all his effort via ODG for that, because I think it is a good achievement if we compare where we are to where we were 12 months ago. I guess I would also add in that, you know, we got the head of internal audit opinion, which was good, which it puts us, you know, quite well amongst other provider organisations. There's very few organisations that get substantial other than generally clinical commissioning groups, because if I'm brutally honest, there's not a lot to audit there, is there? If, if you can really scratch the surface. And I guess the other thing just to add is we also do a lot of work on counter fraud and we submitted a sign off our self review tool. So, you know, I think they've been good meetings, challenging at times, I'm not going to lie, but, you know, fair challenge and healthy challenge. Thank you very much. Okay. On the effectiveness or, or a review or the terms of reference. I have just one question, please, Sharon. Um, and it's, it's just about membership. Um, it's is it the only committee of the board where there isn't a senior clinician in, in attendance. Um, is, is that a strength? Is that a weakness? What do they do in other trusts? Um, I'm not volunteering, by the way. I'm just, just asking the question. <laughs> no, you, you, you really want to attend audit, John, don't you? That's good. Um, I don't know is the answer. Um, perhaps it's something we could look at uh, with Michelle Hughes outside the meeting, Peter. Michelle, Michelle Hughes, I think these are the standard terms of reference anyway, aren't they, that's, that's stick, almost dictated to us from the handbook. So it's quite a unique committee, John, I take your point. It is, it is very unique. Obviously, you'll notice there's no exec membership anyway, because there can't be. But um, these are the latest uh, you know, terms of reference. We could have a look at whether we want to have clinical attendance 
Um, but we do get clinical tensions as we need to, don't we, Peter? We do. We, every every meeting, we didn't have one yesterday because of the situation of, of COVID, etc. But we do, we do have a dive into the risk register of each division. And usually as part of that, when it's a clinical division, um, a clinician um, comes in to um, go, th go through the re risk register for that particular area and uh, describe the, the progress and, and uh, the, um, the actions that, that, that are outstanding in particular, in particular in relation to those particular risks. So we do have attendance from clinicians where required. Yep, okay. Are you happy with that, John? Absolutely. Yeah, just asking the question, I, I, I do appreciate the piece that it's in independence, um, but it was just, um, and it's, it's handbook related, just thought it would be interesting to ask the question anyway. That's a good so thank question. You. No, good it question. is a good question. Okay, thank you. Anything else on that? No, so subject to those amendments that Peter's verbally outlined, which, and Peter, if you could work with Jenny just to make sure we minute those correctly and change it correctly, is everybody happy to approve the terms of reference? Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. If we could move on um, to the next one when I get there. Sorry, the audit committee ones are quite long. Uh, which is the finance committee, Francis and Pete. Thank you, Chair. So the, the report's there. Uh, I think it's a good year and a bit like Mike with quality. I think it's reflected in the financial performance of the trust, which has been really good this year. Um, the committee has worked well. The right people are coming to it. Uh, from the feedback sheets we sent out, there's, there's a couple of issues that I need to pick up on chair about uh, holding people to account for non-attendance or late papers, but we can, we can pick that up. But it's working efficiently, effectively, and it's I think it's delivering good, sound, solid assurance to the board. So I'm happy with where we're going uh, and happy if Pete wants to add anything. Pete, would you like to add anything? Yeah, just to say I think finance you know, has been good. I guess I think just to point out that we're now moving to bi-monthly. You know, we agreed to move to bi-monthly from monthly meetings, but they've all been helpful, challenging meetings. But I think, you know, without that, we maybe wouldn't have got the outside position we achieved this year. OK, thank you very much. Um, any questions on the effectiveness report or the terms of reference? No. Are we happy to approve the terms of reference? Yep. Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you very much. If we can move on to the next one, which must be workforce, I'd guess. It is. Okay, so Dean, um, are you back with us? Um, so Dean and Steve? Actually, Sharon, just so you know, I did this one because it was for last year. Yeah, I just wondered if Dean wants to add anything in his chat. He did say that if we couldn't hear him, Francis, you were to take this anyway. So um, perhaps you could um, start us off, Francis, please. Yeah, so, so the committee obviously is a relatively new committee. We've held five meetings. It's uh, been developing over that period and, and is getting itself into a good place. And the last meeting, which was chaired by Dean, was very good and, and concentrated on some of the strategic issues that we're facing in terms of recruitment and vacancy. Again, there's been some good feedback uh, saying how, how it has developed over the year uh, and that we're now getting towards the right level of discussion and challenge. And we need to just uh, mature that as we go forward. Uh, and it was seen as being really essential anyway but even more so with the importance of the COVID-19 pandemic and how we work with with staff so uh, I don't know if Steve wants to add anything to that I, I did uh, pass it across Dean to make sure he was happy and asked him if he wanted to add anything to the uh, work plan or the ways of working next year but he was happy with what he had agreed on the work plan with Steve and didn't want to change anything at, at the present time but could review it during the year if need be. Thanks, Francis. Steve, was there anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, I'd, I'd echo everything that Francis has said uh, about the committee. Um, can I just add a broader point, if I may, Sharon? You may. Um, I guess, so I've just totaled it up. There's 90 pages of governance here, just for terms of reference for and um, around committees, and so many other pieces of paper that we have servicing those committees and i just wonder as a kind of broader point as we look as an organization to work differently and to utilize some of the changes that we can do i just wonder about the level of governance that we've got in the organization and the feeding of that beast about how much time we spend in that and how much time we spend on development 
that we've got the balance right. It's just a view and maybe something to kick around at a board time out. Yeah, yeah. that, that, feels, that feels like a lot of paper that we have in the organisation servicing committees and doing this type of work. Um, it certainly takes up quite a lot of executives' time, I would suggest. Okay, well, we can certainly look at that. Jenny, we'll um, take that as something to look at for a board development session. Certainly happy to look at that. I think it comes through in some of the feedback for this committee particularly. Um, so, yeah, okay, we can certainly look at that. In terms of reference need to come to the board every year, just um, because obviously the board has the way it is. But, um, yeah, I take your point about the rest of it. We can certainly have a, a look at that. That's fine. Um, is there any questions? And my, my copy doesn't have the terms of reference attached, but um, has there anybody got any questions on the um, review of effectiveness or the terms of reference? Can you hear me, Sharon? Yeah, Dean, yes, we can. All right, thank you. Um, no, nothing more to add. I was just uh, thank you, Francis, for uh, taking that. Who did do it? And, and very happy with that. Thanks, Dean. Okay, are we happy to approve the terms of reference? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. And then the final one, I think, it is the um, annual review of the trust board. Um, I don't think this is something we've done before. Um, obviously, you've all seen it because it's been around you all. Um, are there any comments on the effectiveness or the terms of reference? As I say, it's been around you all in advance. Can I just comment? I'm really, I really think the attendance is very good at this board, and that really helps. And uh, uh, to be honest, the governance has been needed at the level it came in at uh, if you were here three and a half years ago. Uh, this is a different organisation. Uh, and I think we can look developmentally now about you know, where we go loose and where we go tight, etc. But um, basically, there's been massive improvement in the government, and I think it's now feeling the way we do things. And, uh, you know, well done to the board for leading that. Thanks, Mike. Yes, it has been a good attendance this year. It's been improved on last year, so very good. Um, any other comments? Are we happy to approve the terms of reference to the board? Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So I think that takes us on to the next paper, um, which is the um, refreshed strategic um, document, Michelle Moran. Apologies, Chair. Um, home working. Um, yes, this is the, our response in relationship to COVID. If you remember, we had an initial strategic document, which was around that initial phase um, when we were, we're still in phase four, but when we were really in that key emergency planning situation, obviously we're moving now into restoration recovery. So we've just, in accordance with good governance and practice, we have just, apologies, it's my father, um, we have just refreshed our um, strategic document. So it's there for the board um, comments. Hopefully it makes sense as we move into this phase of recovery and getting back to what is going to be COVID business, um, business in a COVID world. Thank you, Michelle. Any questions or comments for Michelle on the revised document? It is the change bit the restore and recover piece? It is, Mark, as I said, as we go into that restore and recover yeah, piece. Good. I, it, it, we get it, the framework there. It's been a really helpful focus for us all. Good. It's been very well received by our, our partners, actually, our stakeholders. Yeah, it's very clear. Um, but we thought we'd just... Because uh, uh, we're still in phase, we're still in level four. We have, as Lynn alluded to earlier on, just set down a little bit of our uh, response, uh, emergency planning response. Um, so we thought we'd just refresh that and we'll keep it active and we'll keep it live. Yeah. I, can I just add, I think it would be really good to actually list out the changes over time that we are going to you know, try and lock in because there's been conversations today about so what specific changes are we are we, are we making? Um, yeah. let, let's get endorse those as part of our organisational development. Yeah, we were doing some real active work on that, um, and, and obviously what we're saying is about moving forward together. So it's about really learning what has worked really well, as we said earlier on, and and kind of carrying on with that, and then just making adjustments on on what we need to do. But it's about keeping that transformation. And as I say, the exec team and and the, the work that Lynn, Pete, and others are doing is really condensing that. So we'll bring something back to the board when we've got that really clear in our minds about how we're going to take things forward into the next stage and work with our partners as well, because I think that's really important. Thank you. 
Thank you all. Anything else on that? No, um, I think your challenge is going to be to keep it on three pages, Michelle, because I think it has um, quite a lot of impact because it is um, short and precise and it does um, focus your mind. So um, I think it's very good. So thank you for bringing that. OK, before we move on to items for escalation, Dean, um, would you like to ask your previous point? You were starting to um, mention something about workforce. Can you hear me OK? We can. Yeah, it was it was just a, it was just the point really about um, those workplaces that have uh, closed and reopened and the social distancing they've been able to put in place in a thought out way and those organizations many of them in the health service which have kept on working and have adapted and just that need I suppose to um, for us to check that we're following best practice where we've kept workplaces open and we're complying with various sorts of guidance around offices and uh, things I think increasingly sort of uh, patients and uh, customers uh, sort of recognize when they're going into a place that is given a lot of consideration to social distances and those that have adapted. It's, it's just one of it's just one of the findings I think about um, this transitional period. Yeah, that's a really good point, Dean, and, and um, we are doing a lot on that. And there is a lot of information coming out from NHS employers, but also the health and safety executives. Pete, yeah. I know you're doing um, a, a lot of this work, especially in relationship to headquarters, but it doesn't just resign around headquarters, it's all our premises. But Pete, do you want to just give us a bit of an overview of the work that you've just started on that? Yeah, I can do, Michelle. So obviously, some guidance was published last week about working safely with COVID, which it's been through the health and safety team, it's been discussed at Surge and Silver Ops and guidance has been produced to help people where so particularly some of our clinical environments and yeah. Rob is going to conclude a piece of work, sorry Rob, the estates team are going to be concluding a piece of work this week which will look at some of the more specific guidance about donning and doffing, PPE etc so we can look at what the estate solution might be on an interim basis. In terms of HQ we're having a discussion at EMT Monday about how we could facilitate potentially we open up HQ in a COVID safe way. I mean, I won't say no more than that. Obviously, we need to discuss what we think, but that would be taking on board the guidance, safe ways of working, one way system around the building, etc. etc. Okay, Great, thanks, Pete. Thank okay, thank you. So, if we move to item 17, items for escalation, I'm not aware of any. Does anybody think anything needs to be escalated from the board? No. Um, any other business? No, um, can I thank um, Adam and um, Lee for their part in facilitating the meeting and Jenny as always and um, just a general thank you to all of you, the exec team for everything that you continue to do and for all the staff. Um, I think Lynn summed it up um, really well when she reported on the COVID situation about the fantastic contribution and uh, pace that has come from all the staff. So thank you very much. So we will close the public part of the um, meeting and I thank anybody who has joined us um, through the YouTube and streaming. Thank you very much for showing interest in our board meeting. Hope you'll join us next month. Um, we will have um, a, just a 15 minute break, board members, if that's OK, and then we will redial in on the new um, Skype connection that Jenny sent you for the part two board meeting. So let's say we'll start that at 12 o'clock, um, if that's OK. That's just over 15 minutes. So I will see you all in uh, 15 minutes at uh, 12 o'clock. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.